and it liberates the H2 from the water. So that's that's the, you know the bubble. So that's the gas that's generated um, in all of our products. Well, it, it is. I mean, this stoichiometry has been in the literature for 30 years. So I haven't really invented chemistry. What I came up with was novel ways to deliver. So the IP is really about mouthfeel taste, how we generate it, and it creates a very niche focus, but it's, it blocks a lot of competition from getting into it. Thank you. And then the booth is back there in the corner, right? It's in the corner, Rick? Your, your booth is in the corner back there, right? It is, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So, again, you've got that clear fishbowl for those of you who really like this. Go to the yeah, other one. Okay, good, good. Okay, so next we have is uh, the carpet puller. Uh, we got Elwood and also Pam. So, take your time coming up here if you will. And in the meantime, uh, we've got, uh, we'll get this set up here for the next, uh, next pitch. Bear with me for a moment. I have dreads. <laughs> and I'll try to make this as famous as possible. But I was the inventor of the, the carpet puller. <clears throat> commercial carpeting is just about everywhere. It's obviously in this room, it's just about every commercial building has commercial carpeting. And that's what I did for the last 14 years. And that's why I'm in the condition I'm in today. I started pulling carpet for a property management company that owned 28 commercial builders that are multi-tenant builders. Every time we changed a tenant, we would change the carpet. And that was my job. And back then, the only thing we had was a carpet knife and a hand puller. Well, I traded my carpet knife for this cane. So what we did was we took the current situation, which was the, the current carpet knife, and then the stand-up pole cutter. The stand-up pole cutter came out a couple of years ago and we thought that was the greatest idea because now you don't have to crawl around on your hands and knees, you can stand up and cut it. The problem is you have to stab and jab the carpet so many times that it's almost nearly impossible to use this tool. So strains and sprains are the number one injury for carpet installers. I know I'm one of them. And the changes in the workforce, if you, if you try and find somebody to do a labor-intensive job today, it's nearly impossible. You know, but one of the worst things is, once you actually get this carpet up off the ground, you know, they're cutting it in the one to two foot strips. You know, and that doesn't facilitate recycling or reuse. And so all that carpeting winds up into the landfills. And five billion pounds of carpeting going into landfills each and every year. So we decided that something has to be done about that. So we started with the premier uh, carpet cutter and the, the pulling ends. The carpet cutter is about as minimal a list of things as we could find. You know, it's as, uh, it has as few parts as we could make it, and it can be used either manually or with the power-assisted pulling base. The power-assisted pulling base is fully patented. The carpet market currently is around $51 billion and it's going to go up to close to $74 billion by 2026. And that's just the carpet market. Our competitive landscape is pretty good with the crane cutter coming out at about $17.4 million and the uh, national 71 and 72 is running around $22.3 million in savings. So the traction that we have right now is we have one full utility patent on Woo! the carpet puller, which includes, <laughs> includes both our hand clamps, the diverted pad, and the carpet puller itself. And we have uh, three utility patents that are currently pending, and we have two provisional patents that are for carpet splitters. I'd like to thank our team uh, usually comes with me and our, our team of advisors at the Centropolis Accelerator. There's no way we could do this without the Centropolis Accelerator. I had a good idea, but I didn't know what to do with it. And once I came up with a good idea, somebody said, well, why don't you get a hold of the Centropolis Accelerator? And it was a godsend. So, I'd like to thank you for, for watching this, but wait, there's more. <laughs>
you can take the commercial to the carpet cutter and just by changing the tip, we talked to a few contractors and, and after showing this carpet cutter to a few contractors, they said, well, you know, it works really good for a carpet, but what we really need is something like that for roofing. Because right now what we're doing is they take their, their knife and they tape it to the end of a stick and they drive along the ground walking backwards on a roof. And I told the guy, I says, are you kidding me? You walk backwards on a roof way up there, you know, with the ground way down there? Yeah, and you're walking backwards? And he said, well, that's the only tool that we have. So I said, I'll tell you what, let's change the tip on this and let's see if we can make this for roofing too. And we did. The Citropolis Accelerator stepped up and they're helping us design a new tip that is just for roofing. So now we can do not only the, uh, the carpet, but the roofing too. And it has a market value just about a little bit larger than the carpet. So I'd like to thank you for taking time to listen to me. And I was doing pretty good. I didn't have too many twitches. <laughs> thank you very much. Detroit, Michigan, uh, Cuts Lounge. I've been a barber for roughly 33 years. I started when I was 11 years old. My granddad was a barber. My father was a barber. And guess what? I'm a barber. <laughs> and so, I, as I worked and, and became a little bit older in my age, you know, one of the things that I started to notice, go ahead, switch, uh, is that there's a problem in our industry that really hasn't been identified. And the problem is, if you've been to the barbershop, I know some of you are still cutting your hair uh, from COVID, uh, please come back and let the professionals do it, right? Uh, but if you're in your barber chair, you'll notice your barber turns around roughly about 90 degrees just to grab a tool. And this happens over the course, let's say, of, a, of, a, of six hours, right? They're turning and they're putting excess strain on their back and shoulders. And it's just, after 30 years, you're going to feel it. So our thought was to try to reduce that excess movement. Save steps, save time. You actually can make more money also. Next slide. Our current options, it's really what you see. Uh, the station is behind the barber. The barber turns to get it and turns to cut. That's it. It's ergonomically insufficient, and it can cause back pain later down the road. I do have back pain. My wife does not rub my back. <laughs> but she would. However, next slide. So what I thought, with this particular movement, you see how unhappy I am, right? <laughs> this particular movement is costing us time, it's costing us money, and so I said, you know, let's figure out something that would make our job a little bit simpler, a little bit easier, a little more ergonomic. Now, this isn't a chair that would be used in a barber shop. Obviously, it would be a barber chair. And so, we designed it just to fit this for this event. And what we have here is called the CAD. Next slide. The CAD, it is an organizational ergonomic solution for easy access to tools, <coughs> help with your workflow, and it also helps to eliminate excess movement. That movement that I've shown you guys that we do every single day for hours on the end. And so what this does, this allows for you, I put my down, I'll talk loud. This allows for the barber to actually put all of their tools right on their barber chair. So instead of having to turn around and grab all their tools, they have their tools here. And so, and so now, instead of turning, I can actually do my haircuts right here. I can access my clipper guards. I can access, and I'm sure none of you guys have seen the pair of shears this day, but I can actually access my shears. And so as we're continuing to cut our hair, everything's here. The caddy is actually battery operated, so it actually can travel. All of your cords are just at the bottom of this area here which will allow for easy storage. Uh, I'm sure you may have seen 
a lot of chords on a barber station that's just all over the place. Well, this will organize that. Next slide. A couple of pictures of it. You can keep going. All right. I'll show you guys anyway. Okay. So, as mentioned, there is a battery that's actually inside of here uh, that would allow for this to be mobile, allow for you to travel and put all your tools uh, in here right now. This is just a five-base station. I know you guys may not cut hair, but you know somebody who cuts hair. You know somebody who cuts your hair. A referral would be great. If you see this action and this movement going, then this is something that your barber may need. It helps to save their back, save their time. Uh, our current uh, target market is we're looking to actually start with barber chair manufacturers. Uh, our goal is to have a product that will fit the barber chair. Not necessarily us fit the barber chair, but the barber chair manufactured in a way that this would be a complement to it. Uh, we also are going to look at uh, professional barbers with 10 years of experience who's actually felt the pain of uh, being at a, a barber for longer than five to ten years, uh, and barber schools. Uh, we want to get into the barber schools. If we can catch early adopters, I believe that this will be a trending product that will allow for them to not only start off new, but start off healthier. Uh, next slide. Uh, our market size currently is 13 to 1,500 barber schools in the U.S. Uh, there are currently 100. 35,000 uh, barber shops in the U.S. plus and actually over 400,000 barbers in the United States. Uh, so we do have a market that we can start working at. Uh, we're going to start in our local area, which is in Detroit. Uh, what up, Doug? Uh, next slide, please. I guess we're going to Detroit is in the house. Okay. Uh, right now we do have our patent pending, which is uh, to... But in the, in the fishing industry, no one's building equipment for that. You have to be, have a skill level to a, to a, uh, right here, to even start with this. Because once you master that, then you go to open face and bait pastures and things like that. Those all require a level of expertise and timing to, to use those equipments. What we're saying is, in this, if I get it, uh, uh, to this particular uh, piece of equipment to market, is we can now open that to lots of people who have one maybe they maybe they had a bad experience when they were a kid you know the guy that was trying to teach them got mad they got mad everybody was crying screaming they're like don't want to do it and they walked away the rest of your life i met a gentleman just over here and he told me he goes i don't fish because i can't cast 10 minutes i had him cast that thing four times and he was casting the ball that fast so you can take all those people who didn't have a chance to learn to fish, or what anybody in your life do teach them, they can go and take this piece of and, and slowly learn to cast. Once they got once they got this down, the second level of this particular particular machine will allow will allow them that the lights and the and the and the uh, the buzzers, but it makes you start to use your thumb. Okay, and once you got the thumb down and the timing back and forward. Then you shut the machine off and it works like every other fishing reel, every other spin cast reel. You pick up any other spin cast reel and start to fish. And we can do it in an hour. It's a simple little thing to do and it takes all the stress out of, of teaching people to fish. We want to open this up to women, veterans, people with some, some physical disabilities, people who, who just don't have a chance to do it because there's nothing in the market that's taking care of their needs or looking at their needs. That's where I saw the, the, the problem. This was the solution I came up with. And uh, unlike a lot of the companies, but here, we're just, we're brand new. So we don't have any marketing. That's one of three prototypes that are on the planet Earth right now. Uh, but the, the integration of this technology and some of the other companies that you saw here today, the gentleman that did the, the has the, the app with the food, this marriage of technology into our everyday lives is coming. It's going to affect every single thing that we do. Driving, reading books, how we order our fruit, how we take care of our food, you know, how we fish. All this stuff's coming because three years ago, you could not have built that three years ago. 
that technology is moving fast enough and shrinking fast enough. There's a computer in there that does pretty much everything your laptop does. It's as big as my thumbnail. That's what's in there. Three years ago, they didn't build it. So as you see this, this coming in the future, things like this are, are, are going to pop up. You're going to see more and more integration of that. AI is, is amazing with what it can do. Um, so that's basically what, what, what uh, R&D is about. We're trying to get, the, like I said, we're looking for uh, a licensing uh, situation. We're not wanting a manufacturer. We just want to find somebody that says, hey, I, I like that idea. I'd like to go with it. And partner with them and see where we can go and see how many people we can get to fish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, how about a question from the panel? Um, I, I can see this as being a, a great licensing opportunity. The one question I think any potential licensee would have is, you know, what what's your retail price versus what's your cost? Um, yes, that uh, in, in any situation. So, I've learned over the last three years uh, when I went to ICAS.